My theory is he's a strong character, like I said, top five. And Kakaru has, has proved that he's he's really he's really good. Uh, but he has holes in his gameplay that because he is so different than what we have seen before are not as intuitive, but they are programmed into the situations. And even a character like a grappler like Lily gives JP a hard time if she knows how to approach the match. Welcome to the Absolute Guard Podcast. Yes, welcome. This is episode 57. My name is Benny, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, John, who has been a training training partner and mentor of mine in uh, Street Fighter V and Street Fighter VI. How's it going, John? Pretty good, pretty good. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm flattered to, that you consider me a mentor. I definitely consider you a training partner, too, and I've learned a lot about the Dalsum matchup from playing you. So, <laughs> nice <laughs> job, so. man. <laughs> I'm just hoping that I, give, that I was given enough... Uh, Given enough good enough practice for you for these for these last few years for sure man for sure yeah so who do we have on the show today uh so we have on the show another john the one that goes by velociraptor what's up how's it going john hey how's it going guys thank you very much for having me on it's been a minute uh or i've been wanting to be on i should say for a little while and so it's yeah. it's really cool to finally be able to jump on yeah i'm, I'm usually the one in charge of like you know contacting the guests and getting that stuff scheduled and like i think i've been reaching out to you for almost like three months now we've been trying to get things sorted out so your people my <laughs> people just hard to make it work right but we finally did it yeah so you all know uh, you you all will know of john as from uh, event hubs fame he's uh the uh uh w one of the primary driving forces behind the event hubs podcast um and uh event hubs is a site you've been working with them for quite a while if i recall correctly yeah, I think I jumped in with them in uh, late 2014, and I guess October would have been my anniversary. So, um, however many years oh. that's been—is that nine? Gosh. Nine years. And so, yeah. so yeah, been doing that. And now the main focus for me is broadcast. So there's a YouTube channel that we've been doing where we do both our show talk and block podcast, where we discuss you know things that are going on. Zangief winning the major is JP overpowered. Straight a lot of Street Fighter Six stuff. Although today. <laughs> We put up a uh, best and worst fatalities in Mortal Kombat 1. There's some pretty ah. iffy fatalities in that game we're seeing. Um, they're kind of running out of ideas is, is the thing. But we talk about stuff like that. And uh, we uh, we also do some video essays, the histories of characters and where they might go after uh, you know Street Fighter 6, now that being the latest on the timeline and other rankings and tips and all that kind of stuff. So if you like fighting games and, and it's both you know teaching and culture, we got it at the, uh, our, uh, our YouTube channel. Nice. Very cool. I have, to, I have to check that out. So, yeah. this, since this is your first time on the show, typically what we like to find out is a little bit about you. So, usually I like, I like to start to find out what's the origin of, of the gamer tag of Velociraptor. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So in, uh, I don't even, 500 years ago when uh, Street Fighter 4 <laughs> was coming out, or actually it was out for a little bit, and uh, my buddy Nick going, Driftwood, I think he's been on the podcast, he yes. was like, hey, there's a new Street Fighter game coming out, and we hadn't, I didn't play Third Strike, and it, so it really had been since 2 when I was a little kid, and I was like, oh, I'll get that, it'll be fun. So we get it, and there's a tournament going on, and uh, we end up going to this tournament thinking we're hot stuff. Is this a, a PG or PG-13 or what? Podcast. No, no, you're good. Yeah, say whatever you want. We just we'll okay. make every episode explicit. <laughs> okay, so we went to this uh, tournament thinking we were hot shit playing with a uh, you know Xbox 360, Ryu and Ken, not realizing <laughs> that you can backdash a focus attack on Waco. You know, so but we go to a tournament <laughs> and we sign up and then they ask, okay, so what's your handle? And uh, I was like, what was that? Like, that was completely foreign to me. But early in that day, we had watched the movie Step Brothers, which was still funny at the time. And there's a scene in Step Brothers where they uh, they realize that they're more friends than enemies. And by saying the first three things that come to their mind, and one of those things is Velociraptor. 
it was down between that or John Stamos and Velociraptor went out that day. So <laughs> I was just kind of off the top of my head. It felt like a spur of the moment thing, just like in that scene. So I was like, oh, Velociraptor. And then and here we are. So it's it's been that ever since. <laughs> so it just, it just stuck that whole time, huh? Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's cool enough, you know, considering, gosh, the range of handles and gamer tags in the FGC, I, I think yeah. it fits just fine. It's cooler than, you know, it's, it's in the top 80%. So yeah. I think it's aged pretty well. I, I agree. Yeah. I agree. You haven't had well, it, it, felt the I need mean, to like, change it or anything. Yeah. It's yeah. like, what's a, it's like one, like who doesn't like dinosaurs? And then like two, I'm thinking about it. And I'm like, I don't know anybody else that goes by a dinosaur name. Like there's no like T-Rex out there. There's no Tyrannosaurus. There's no, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm brontosaurus burger or whatever like that right you're like the <laughs> one guy that stands up so that's Heck cool yeah. i just assumed like you were a big jurassic park fan or something or like you know like all the movie magic that went into that and stuff <laughs> yeah i mean i did go to school for for film and television and such but uh no i mean Jurassic the first Jurassic park's a really good movie i enjoyed the second one as a kid but nah, it's not that great of a film and then the rest are kind of just whatever um, yeah. I do have a, but like just even when I do stuff like this, I have a, a shirt. My wife actually got one of two of these for me. Um, oh, with, like nice. Velociraptor stuff on them. This one has a skeleton. The other one just has like a big Velociraptor uh, face thing. But uh, yeah, people like to see to get in with it. It's a, it's a good name. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I just have any... to say, like I saw, I've seen something in Facebook too. Like it comes in my feed every now and then. It's, it's actually a Jurassic Park shirt, and it has like the lost raptor, like in the bushes kind of thing. The whole like clever girl thing, and like I, I always look at that about. shirt. Yeah, I always see that shirt, and I'm just like, man, this would be perfect with John. <laughs> it, I think if it's the same one that you're talking about, I clicked through on that ad, and yeah. uh, it was like a hundred and forty dollars or something like that. Ooh. It was like, <laughs> oh, it must be really uh, nice. Yeah, but uh, I'm not gonna I need to go fund me for that. I don't know. Yeah, man. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a little That's much. much. It's made with real vol velociraptor. It's a premium <laughs> price. <laughs> Bits of the young before they, they get too old and tough. Yeah. <laughs> this is a morbid podcast, you guys. I don't know about yeah. this. So <laughs> I guess so your your gamer tag origin is actually tied to your fighting game origin. And that's another question we usually ask is like how did you get started playing fighting games? You mentioned Nick oh. and this this tournament being the the driving force there. Well, you know, uh so there's two prongs to that or two pillars to that. One is that we got Street Fighter Four, we were playing we found ourselves playing a lot at home, and then he went on to Reddit or whatever it was at the time um mm. and found out about the local FGC. But he kind of found out about that and saw that they were having a Guitar Hero tournament. And I was a Guitar Hero main at the time. This was oh, wow. around the time of Guitar Hero okay. 4 just coming out. So I went to a spot called Arcade in the Box for a Guitar Hero tournament and uh, and got second because I choked on a, on a song that I usually get 100 I, At the time, I got 100% on, but I couldn't do it then. Yeah. And I missed like right at the end. It was just, you know, like a movie. But that's okay. It was, <laughs> it was fun. And it was, they're like, I was talking to this guy, Abe, that was kind of running the spot. He was the manager. And he was like, yeah, we play Street Fighter uh, a lot. So if you guys ever want to come out for Street Fighter 4. Um, and so, yeah, I, we did. And the rest was history. We kind of just kept coming back. It was so much fun. The idea of competition, the idea of grinding with other people and realizing that we weren't as good as we thought we were, but victory was also within reach. And it was a real exciting, enticing mountain to climb to meet all these guys like Marvin and it was Aaron Holly and rock and a whole bunch of people in Tucson. Um, so, so yeah, that was the other pillar of it. So we were playing street fighter in the background, but guitar hero was my gateway drug. Uh, okay. Very, very humble beginnings. That's, that's cool. Man. Yeah. That's awesome. And uh, what character did you start out with when you started playing Street Fighter Four? I played Ken to uh, Driftwood's Ryu, ah, and there we go. He was saying like every ten minutes, he it felt like he was saying he was going to pick up a different character, and he rarely would. And one day he's like, "I'm going to pick up Goken because he was actually you didn't start the game with him; you had to unlock yeah. him, and he was the last, I think, one that you could unlock." So. We finally got him and he's like, it's so cool. This old man is so buff and he's, he's got all these cool, you know, fireball abilities and such. And I was like, you're not going to pick up Goken because you said you were going to pick up Bison. You said you're going to pick up Cammy. You just you don't follow through on any of these things, but I am going to do it. And I'm going to kick your ass for like when you play him for 10 minutes and say you've picked him up as you've done with all these other characters. So I just I didn't I didn't plan to. But one day I sat down and started playing him uh, on that basis and just sort of stuck with him. And then like. Mm -hmm. We went to these tournaments and I, I did well because one, you know, I was just doing all right at the game, but also 
no one else played this character, not only in like Tucson or in Arizona, but like even out in California and, and like the U S yeah. and like, there were a handful when she got out, you know, but, but no one else really played them. And so every time I went to any kind of event, like people didn't have as much experience against them. And so I had like a little mm-hmm. bit of an advantage that way too. got away with some stuff and he hit hard when he got away with the stuff. So it was interesting. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that actually, you know, that, that really helped uh, move me along too and, and feel that fire that was like, man, like victories have been reached and I'm getting away with some stuff and climbing up and making Abe mad. So <laughs> that is, that is actually going to be one of my, the things I wanted to inquire about because like when people think of Goken, like, Honestly, like, I don't know if there's another player in the world that people think of when it, during that time. Like, you were that guy. Like, you were like, I mean, I don't think there's even like a Japanese representative that I can, I can name off the top of my head that played that character. It was like, when people thought of Goken, it was you. Well, there was Bullcat. Um, and he, I don't think he traveled much. I think he played online a lot. Um, I, I got to the number one spot, I think, during AE. Uh, I'm not even sure. Mm-hmm. Or maybe it was 2012, and I don't remember even which ones they reset for or not. But I was there for a little while before the end. Um, but I think it was like Bullcat and like Proud Strawberry were two names that I remember uh, being really high level. Mm. And I just don't think they traveled as much. And I was fortunate to be able to travel at the time and play in Wednesday night fights, yeah. which got a lot of a lot of eyeballs. So that was that was kind of the situation there. But I, and I got some recognition from from some of the top Japanese players when at final round with one of my best events, like that I most fondly remember, um, like Kazunoko and, and Momochi kind of gave me shout outs on Twitter as the the best Goken. And so at least for a little while, I was probably up there at the top, but there were a couple of guys. And then Infiltration picked up the character as a, one of his 6,000 secondary pocket characters. <laughs> yep. And if Infiltration's playing your character, there's already a good chance that you're uh, at least second or third behind him. So <laughs> yeah. there was that too. But uh, yeah, I had, I had some moments in the sun. Nice, nice. So one thing that's that's interesting about that era of being like the best in a, spe- a character specialist is that... Um, well, well to, to contrast it with the modern era, character specialists can kind of band together via online discourse or like yeah. uh, either discords or Twitters or whatever. Um, and I'm curious, like, what what was the landscape like for you as a character specialist back in the Street Fighter Four days when you couldn't as easily network network with other Goken players? I well, so for me personally, Drift would would like do research and stuff, and I. I always played um, by feel to to a degree where I I know I stunted myself, but at the same time it just felt in, intuitive enough and it, it got me far enough. Um, but yeah. Driftwood would do research and see other stuff and then bring me back tech every so once in a while. So, like in that game, it would be very commonplace to crouch tech, which would see your character either defend from a throw or stick out a a crouching short kick or short. And uh, so with Goken, he had a counter and Driftwood was saying, you know, like I saw this or th- this theory works, you know, think about it. If, if people are crouch teching, you can do jab, jab and then low counter and the little kick will come out and then you'll counter it and go into your big, you know, counter hit. And I so see. there was a lot of stuff like that that he would bring to me and I would implement. So uh, I, I owe Nick a lot in in certain ways. And um, uh, so anyways, he, he helped me uh, to develop things like that. But I played a lot by feel. What was the original question? My original question was how how did you find tech and what was and more like another like build up question yeah. to to like how how what was your relationship like with other people in the go like other go oh, right, players right, right. and how did you communicate yeah. with them back then? So so that was my own personal development side outside of just playing off my intuition. Nick would would share things and if I was in an open mood, then I would listen and it often benefited because he has a much more. Um, scientific, like numbers, sciencey approach to the game. Mm. So, uh, so I sometimes get some stuff from him. But as far as the network of other players, there were other Goken players. And once this was the era of Facebook getting pretty big, and that being the main way of communication. So it was either PMs or even there were Facebook groups at the time, and that would be a big thing for, uh, um, you know, Street Fighter Four. There's just like eight billion Street Fighter Four groups, and they probably <laughs> still are. Um, yeah. And then the instead of Discord, it was you know, a, a group. So anyways, I get invited to these groups and, and I would meet people at tournaments that I would go to like, you know, defend the North or at Evo or um, CEO, wherever. And, um, it, you know, get to know them and then Adam and, and then they would send me PMs on Facebook sometimes, or, or sometimes on Twitter, although I wasn't as active. I'm, I'm never really as active on Twitter. Um, uh, but <laughs> there, so there would be some contact like that and people would, um, hit me up for tech sometimes or, um, 
or just say like what's up and like i i, I really like this or that or uh, could you watch a match for me and, and tell me or like i really like the most common one was i really like the character but like i don't get him or he's too hard to play or yeah. I, I don't know why he didn't feel intuitive to people I, i'd really have to go back and play that game to really know it again you know and be able to to talk about it on that level but at the time that was just some yeah. of the, the responses and, and things that were said but there was a network and and it was mostly through um social media and and i will say like one of the coolest things about that was i went on a family vacation one time to new york city and there was one evening in particular that i had free and so i just hit up i don't even remember one of these groups and said hey i'm in new yeah. york city uh yeah. is, is what's going on and someone's like Mm, well, the games are at Bum 16's apartment. You can't go there by yourself, white boy. But uh, where are you staying? And it was like somewhere kind of close to Times Square. So I was like, okay, at this time we'll come and meet you. And so some guy that I had never met in person before uh, comes by and picks me up at the Renaissance Hotel. Uh, we talk and meet and everything. And we walk and we go take the subway to some spot. And then there, a couple other guys join us. And then we go in a car and we get to Bum 16's apartment and go up there. And, and I got to play in their weekly event and a first to 10 against Sanford Kelly in our uh three-part saga this would be part two didn't go well for me but th it was the the whole point was i could just was suddenly in new york which is a place i'd been maybe uh once before in my life and yeah. i could just hit up social media and you have the fgc family everywhere you go and they were yeah. like welcome like here it's it's in this spot we'll get you there where are you at we'll come to you bam 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 and i got to immediately go and then you get there and you sit down and you start playing and all of a sudden even though everything is foreign you speak the same language of street yeah. fighter you know in this in this instance and then all of a sudden oh man everyone's speaking the same language and then the competition kicks in and you're playing in the tournament and oh man it was a really awesome experience to have yeah. And uh, in, in just in Bum's apartment, man, with and with a bunch of people like it wasn't just Sanford, it was a handful of names of you know people that we know and would recognize and have done great things in tournaments and without. Um, so it's just cool that the family extends in such a way. And, and the same kind of thing happened in Hawaii when I was there at one time. And yeah. and like it's, it's pretty much anywhere. My buddy Tyler went to uh, Ireland and, and hung out with like the SF2 and SF2 community there. Uh, I don't oh, know. Wow. I just met in a pub, you know, and it's like that's so awesome because they're on work. Yeah. And then also on SF2, so <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Um, John, John, John speaks highly of the the Hawaii community because he's been there a couple of times. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, very very welcoming community. Um, yeah. Willing to drive you around in in the crazy Hawaii traffic. Uh, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> um, I I I'm vaguely familiar with your your rivalry or saga with Sanford, but I was curious if you could elaborate on it. I I didn't know there were three parts to it. <laughs> so um okay so at kind of toward the height of my competitive run i they, we were doing it was an evo i guess it was 2013 maybe i'm not sure don't quote me on it but uh there was a team wednesday night fights versus team nlbc which um you know is the the east coast weekly that produces a bunch of really really strong players west coast we had a bunch of really strong players and those are the two main spots and more have erupted and and, and shown that they they can contend um and the geography of the comp the competitive world of the uh, united states is, is a little different now i think but still hot spots you know west coast yeah. east coast so at nlbc or um, at evo we're going to play a 5v5 and it was like the best guys at the time we picked a team and um and they picked their best five guys and Sanford Kelly was on the list and we kind of just picked an order beforehand. Both teams had to, I ended up getting picked against Sanford as the uh, third person in the roster. So he's playing uh, Sagat and I'm playing Goken, of course, man, it was, it was intense because Sanford's no stranger to the big stage. And I, I don't think I'd ever been on the Evos main stage before, maybe once or twice, but nothing mm -hmm. like where everyone was actually watching. It was like in the daytime where, you know, a handful of people are watching, but and you'll go back and watch the, the VOD, but really you don't have a bunch of people sitting on the edge of their seats. And here everyone was like betting bison bucks and such. And it was, a, it was a big meaningful thing. <laughs> so we sit down and Sanford's no stranger to this. And I'm trying to be honed in and ready, but I'm also, you know, like I shoot with this hand. <laughs> um, and you know so it was it was rough but i found that I, I got right in that perfect spot of adrenaline but control and to end the first game it was a two out of three for each match to end the first game it was like a chip out situation third round and he uh he throws a tiger knee to chip me out 
and I react with ultra and, and kill him with it. And the whole place just loses it. And it's like, dude, and we're in, and I'm like, oh man, now I've got some momentum. And I just proved to myself that I can react ultra his, uh, his tiger knee. <laughs> Yeah. You're done, Sanford. And so then he beats me the next round. And now it's like, you know, one, one. And um, and I ended up uh, because Sagat is such a tall character. If you do Goken's horizontal Tatsu, which you can actually control and move back and forth. If you use the EX version, you use that on its wake up. He can't DP you. And it, and it not only is a weird cross up, oh. but you can move it to the other side. So even if he's blocking correctly, you can make him have to block the other way. And it's, long story short, it's impossible. So I got Sanford with that like three or four or five times. And uh, I could hear Driftwood. He yeah. was in the front row. There's like yelling at it because he was there's like a code name for it, like croissant or something like that. And he's like, <laughs> he, can't, he doesn't know the croissant. I keep doing it. <laughs> and because um, we were cool like that and had, had sweet names for our uh, secret move strategies. But uh, anyways, I beat him there. And that ended up being the first part of the saga. And uh, so and, and WNF Wednesday Night Fights won that, too. We won it like five one. The only person on our team to lose was Snake Eyes, who was the hottest guy at the time uh, mm. in all senses of the of the term. And uh, <laughs> he was a world class player. I mean, he still is, obviously. But that was when he was like really coming into his own. But he lost that day. So it was interesting. Um, Dominion got him. But then so the next meeting was maybe six months, a year later. I'm not sure. And I'm in New York and Sanford wants to do a first to ten. And he's not playing Sagat this time. He's playing Oni. And I have no, oh, yeah. well, maybe a little experience against Oni because Rock played him. But um, I beat him the first game. I beat him the second game. And then he gets me like seven games in a row. And I, I knew what I was doing. But I, I, me being an instinctual player, like I said earlier, I can yeah. know something in my brain. But to get it to translate to my fingers in real time is a whole other thing. And it usually takes me some time. And I, I was watching myself in slow motion continuing to do the same dumb dive kick that he was just walking under and punishing. But and then I got one more game and he beat me 10, three. So that was a pretty conclusive second round goes to Sanford. Although then we did the tournament that they, that they do uh, on a weekly basis and he doesn't enter the tournament, which I thought was kind of weird and oh. I won it. So it was like, Oh man, but I couldn't get any, you know, there was no chance for revenge and I don't know what that yeah. was, but Ooh, all right, fair enough. Okay. <laughs> it's kind of interesting, right? Like, yeah. And he also, I remember him also in his very Sanford way, Sanford's such a character and the FTC is, is very lucky to have him. But I remember him saying, I want you to learn the matchup. I want you to learn it. So I'm, I'm going to keep playing you. I want you to learn it. And it's like, dude, it was just, it, it just felt a, a little bit, um, wasn't a hundred percent just, you know, helpful and praise, but it's fine. It was fun <laughs> and, and Sanford's a good cat. So then uh, it's one to one as far as our little saga is concerned. And Mike Watson wants to splash some uh, excitement around Super Arcade, which is kind of having a, a rougher time because trying to live and, and pay a California rent when you're, you know, have people coming in and still paying quarters to play Street Fighter is, is hard to do. So he throws Evo Moment 37 uh, Reloaded, I believe. Was it Reloaded? Yeah. Reloaded. Something like that. Yeah, not that. rewired that's next thing so <laughs> reload it and he gets daigo to come out and justin wong to come out and they're going to play their their third strike thing again and yada yada and and it's mostly for old games but then there's also a street fighter 4 tournament because that's how he actually gets everybody to come and so it was this cool marriage of old and, and new but it was in the same building that moment 37 happened so i got to go there which was really cool and sanford flew out for this one so he comes to my territory for round three we fought in vegas we fought in new york and now we're in socal and we both make top eight losers side. So we have to wait until Sunday. But of course, you can look at the bracket and you know who you're going to play. Nick and I see, oh, Sanford Kelly first round. We got to be theatrical about this. So we're waiting all day because it's, you know, we, we qualify on Saturday. And then on Sunday, <laughs> I did some dumb video and posted it on Facebook from earlier in the story where uh, I like chugged a Red Bull and like crushed it on my forehead. But secretly, I had already kind of cut some holes in the side. So it was easy and like called out <laughs> Sanford. And and then um, we finally got the top eight. Nick and I had found that they were selling these. Oh, gosh, I have to tell this part of the story, too. Sorry. Uh, Sanford, it, somewhere in between these times, had uh, famously lost a crazy set against Rico Suave at NLBC on stream ah, yes. and uh, <laughs> got up. And threw his stick down, and I don't think it was his, but I don't want that for sure. I don't want to spread wrong misinformation. Yeah. Uh, but throws his stick down. Rico Suave uh, does the, this number, and then just kind of like looks at the camera and thumbs up and gives a thousand watt smile because Rico Suave is 
a you know pretty guy and <laughs> people are just losing their minds over it i think uh jeff mendocino made a uh made a a uh, what was it M- a mentos commercial out yep. of it yep uh, exactly. uh there was a <laughs> There was a flash game that was yeah, made. It was throw Sanford's game. stick, <laughs> and you had to like click thing. stop the meter at the right point to get the yeah. most bounce on you. It was, it's hilarious. So the, you know, Sanford's the gift that keeps on giving in the FGC. <laughs> so that had happened. So now we have all this day to get ready for top eight because it's the last thing that happens for the tournament. And we find that they're selling these little mini sticks and they're only like 20 bucks, 25 bucks. We buy one and we take it apart and we, un- we, we loosen all of the screws. So it's just barely together and we rip all the inside up. So it's just all kind of uh, jumbled in there. And, um, and then Nick finds a broom. And so when top eight happens, they call our match. I run up to the front before Sanford gets up there and I yell at him. Like, if you guys have seen that movie, Troy, where Achilles is calling out Hector and he's just standing at the gates yeah. of Troy and he's like, Hector. <laughs> so I'm like, Sanford, just trying to like, you know, just, you know everyone's kind of like sort of laughing, maybe not. I'm not sure. Is it funny? He's kind of dumb. It's ah, let's go with it. You know, we're just, we're here to play video games professionally. And so Sanford comes up and it's fun and we play. And uh, I don't even remember what the final score was, but I, I, I beat him. And uh, so I got up and I had the stick nearby and I was like, yeah, and, and win or lose. I was part of me was hoping to lose because then I could directly recreate it, but it couldn't. So it won. <laughs> so I just I was like hype. I picked up the stick and just slammed on the ground and it just exploded into a million pieces and everyone kind of <laughs> cheered. And Safford was a great sport about it. He just, all right. All right. And Nick comes up and he sweeps it up because um my nickname was the janitor because I would use sweep so often with Goken because it was yeah, minus would. two. It was safe. Yeah, it was safe. Minus two. <laughs> mm-hmm. So, or maybe it was minus three. I don't know. It was it was safe. And so Nick came up and swept it up, and it was it even made it to Event Hubs on, in an article. <laughs> funnily <laughs> enough, um, as part of the highlights of Moment Thirty Seven Reloaded, amongst other things such as Daigo doing the Moment Thirty Seven parry and combo into a win yet again during an actual tournament or exhibition match with Justin Long, it was pretty magical. Um, but so you know, up there with the best of them, throwing sticks that I had already broken up and stuff, and gloating too much <laughs> over Sanford. But that was the third and final round. So um, and I'm, no no rematches, but GGs. <laughs> Did you ever end up playing Sanford in Street Fighter Five? I don't think so. I, I think ever. I um, I don't know how much he traveled or not, but I, I really didn't travel too much. And then uh. between that game, just not I, I traveled more at the beginning, and uh, but I don't think I ever really played him. And uh, so, yeah, they kind of all ended there and then it's fine by me. It was, it was good. And I'll, I'll take it. <laughs> I, mean, I, was, I was thinking, I was like, you mentioned playing by feel and it just kind of made me laugh a little bit because that's one of, uh, in Street Fighter 4, that's one of Fei Long's like titles. Was, Don't think feel. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, for you, for, for Nick to be the, the tech guy and like the lab guy for you and then you to be the one be like, here, implement this in your game. And you know, I, I just thought that that was kind of funny, considering considering exactly what you just said. <laughs> yeah, a little poetic, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, like, I'm in Nick theatrics. Oh, come on! Like, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's yeah, there's definitely been other hype videos that he's had with him and uh, Mr. S and K. I remember him. Yes. Was was he? I think it was the the A League stuff. Did he wrote on some. I don't, did he come in on somebody's back one day, like riding a horse? Is that you yeah, or is it somebody yeah, else? No. I think I think two people dressed up like a horse and then he rode on them. <laughs> yeah. Am I, I wrong? Did like somebody was the front of the horse and someone was the back of the horse? <laughs> Something like that. Sounds that. <laughs> very right. He's also he also yeah. did the Nicken where we had this giant chicken suit and he wore that and like was during some first to ten exhibition in Tucson was like balking around the <laughs> <laughs> arcade in the box well it's, uh, yeah that that's that sounds just like something nick would do and he was really good with um you know uh, graphic design and stuff so he'd make little videos little hype videos with uh you know moving titles and special effects and stuff so yeah, yeah. but he he did a lot to hype up the community and, and run tournaments and get the uh the excitement going yeah yeah he was awesome. it's basically <laughs> like a, a promoter for the fgc in a lot of ways yeah, <laughs> you know. yeah. Mm-hmm. And he knew how to get people's attention and put yep. like cool little prizes, uh, which, hey, by the way, uh, John recently did at uh, one of our recent tournaments uh, here in Tucson. So that was really cool. But yeah, Nick would do that kind of a thing too, or he'd give prizes or make a little un- interesting side, you know, headhunter bets, or if you do this, yeah, or there's a side, bounties, you know, yeah. loser tournament, something like that. Yeah. Um, always yeah. made it interesting. Even at a, at a recent tournament uh, locally, he dressed up like, uh, Ken, I think, yeah. or like, like Barbie Ken, 
Him but the also Ken movie, Ken. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, like, really? I didn't know Yeah. That. Yeah, he like came out with like a big box around him, so it looked like he was a Ken doll. And I guess he, he said he was gonna go see Barbie later on that night, so I think I guess he was reusing the costume. But mm. you know, he signed up stay, as Max still... Kennergy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he did. Oh, that's awesome. I did not hear yeah. anything about that. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> <good> times, <laughs> okay. So, Street yeah. Fighter Four, uh, you know, after the after Ultra, you know, Street Fighter Five eventually comes out. We we've we know that the launch was a little lackluster. But how did you? How, what what were your early impressions of the game? And you know, like, what was your relationship like with Street Fighter Five as a whole? I came into Street Fighter Five wanting to play differently, so I went from a zoning character to a rushdown character in Nikali. It was also super interesting because not only was he sort of cool looking in his trailer, but he had all of the different moves. So dive kick and command grab and plenty of pressure and then a charge move and then an uppercut and a three frame uh, jab. And he had all the tools. Mm -hmm. And uh, but I also wanted to play more by the book and put more scientist into my approach, so to speak. So I think that there was a lot gained by that but I never really got back into the kind of groove that I felt in Street Fighter 4, and I, I suspect that's part, the main part of the reason why. But I played this game, and um, so I was patient with myself to not do as well because I was playing a different style of character, trying to broaden my horizons, and I was trying to think about things more than just feel about things. But man, you're right that there was a lot wrong with it to begin with, and that made it very um unsatisfying to it was like it was fine to win but it really sucked to lose and that was my main issue with the game another way of saying it might be that the risk and reward was skewed in such a way that it didn't feel um it, it felt unjust in a lot of ways that you would lose because the even though capcom had started really paying attention to certain things that would eventually grow into what i think is um their positioning to create the most balanced street fighter game that we've seen yet at this time they were going through some growing pains and some change of management and mm -hmm. that you could tell that they weren't quite where they needed to be and they were rushed because they released like a 70 percent completed game and had to kind of put the pit, bits and pieces together after launch yeah. so with all that in mind we got a hurried not finished and therefore not very well balanced risk and reward game and although that's it's not fair to just say that that was the whole story of it it ran through a lot of problems throughout its life uh, in, in various ways. There was like the overpoweredness of the V triggers through, especially through season two. Yeah, everyone It was really bad in season one, but <laughs> everyone didn't know the problems uh, enough to take uh, full advantage of them. Even still, it was crazy. The damage output, the benefit from using heavy buttons because of the input lag, things like that. It became uh, much more, uh, you know, if you made, so if you tested someone's reactions, that was to your benefit. And that felt bad because if you do react to something, but the game is too slow for your reaction and you end up getting punished extremely hard for that, it's just not a good experience. And you sit there watching your life bar go down and you're just like, what, what am I doing here? <laughs> I should go outside. So that was my relationship with the game. It got better. And, and you could see Capcom starting to learn from their mistakes. It went completely under new management. And I think that was not all of it, but a big part of what was going on. And uh -huh. uh, the guys that are doing Street Fighter Six, a lot of them, including the two top guys that we see, um, Nakam uh, Nakayama and Maj um, Sujimoto. Uh, uh, Matsumoto, Matsumoto. Matsumoto, Matsumoto. Um, they have done an awesome job and they started by writing the ship as, as pretty much as best they could with Street Fighter V um, but what they did in Street Fighter VI was a whole other level And um, but even in SF5 <laughs> sans kind of Luke at the end which totally was a, a huge weight on the wrong side of the scale just top security, <laughs> but they had been getting to a very uh, attending to a lot of the game's needs while still maintaining and keeping the game what it always had been which i sort of had issue with to begin with but that's okay you know and it, it got it got to its best point that it um it, it could be uh from the amount of time they had and, and that they were going in the right direction then they got to street fighter six that was good so uh my relationship with five though to answer that question was i i tried to like it i didn't like it but i denied that i didn't like it and then i just i, I super didn't like it and nobody likes the second game by the way after you you know get introduced <laughs> no the second game everyone hates that game and then yep. the next one's awesome because it's not the because it's not the one before <laughs> ask a third strike in you know um and and a lot of the street fighter 2 guys tolerate street fighter 4 and like street fighter 3 so uh, but anyways uh i i i felt like 
I stopped playing four, or I'm sorry, five, like maybe a year before it, it actually ended, but I was really looking forward to six and um, it, it was, it was fine. It did its job. It stayed above water and it kept yeah. the franchise above water. And now we, it was a stepping stone towards six, which I'm very happy to be at. Cool. Okay. Cool. Yeah, um, I wanted to go back to um, like your event, hub, talk about event hubs a little bit, because you said you started there in 2014. Cause it's been nine years. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit before Street Fighter V. Um, I, I'm kind of wondering, like, what kind of started that whole thing? Like, how did you even get involved in doing that or wanting to do that? I didn't read Event Hubs, nor sure you can really. Again, when I, I when Nick was the one that went and looked for everything, I really mean it. Like, mm-hmm. he was he would show me tech. He would know, know these players before I would know them. But we were living in L.A., and uh, I was out there for pursuing some stuff in acting and writing and such. And, but mm-hmm. I would go to Super Arcade all the time. And so uh, Nick noticed that they were hiring at Event Hubs. And I was enjoying writing as part of my uh, my thing. And so that was kind of a marriage, potentially, of two of my passions that I was you know, exploring at the time. I'm kind of growing up after college. And mm-hmm. so I, I submitted. A, I was like, oh, yeah, I know of Event Hubs. And I, I, could, I could do this. This would be cool. It would be interesting to, to try out. So I submitted my resume. And I got a call back. And I, I got second. And then they picked another guy over me. Um, but the whole reason I was really in the running, you could, I think, a, a big part of it, which set me apart, was they knew me from Wednesday Night Fights, from watching the stream. So mm-hmm. that was cool. That gave me a huge advantage. And even though I didn't get picked first, it didn't quite work out with the previous guy. So they hired me on as their second choice. They, they messaged me a week or two later, or what, whatever it was. And I was like, yeah, I'll take the job. And so I got to rem- work remotely, um, writing about video games, about fighting games specifically. I was directly plugged into Wednesday Night Fights, which was one of the big beacons of competitive fighting game. Um, what would you call it? Like kind of like a just a central location for it in the U.S. Yeah. And I was in a great position to kind of do that kind of a thing. So, um, again, I, I owe a little bit of that to Nick for sure and got into it that way. And, uh, and it was really fortunate. Cool. And then, like, in terms of, like, kind of their reputation, like, especially when Shoryuken was a big thing, like, I know Event Hubs has kind of had, like, kind of a negativity around it or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, how's it how's it been for you, like, working for them? Like, have you have you been approached by people, like, at events? Like, oh, you're, you know, I mean, I'm sure some people know you as Velociraptor from Wednesday Night Fights, right? But do you ever get anybody that's just like, oh, you're the guy that, that writes for event hubs or something like that? Yeah, so I, I hadn't gone to Evo in a few years, but I went this year. And I don't think anybody, like, recognized me. It was probably, like, between some a few a few less than 20 maybe but like mm-hmm. a handful of people approached me over the weekend and it was always for the podcast for event hubs for being on youtube i don't think any of it was for uh, my competitive play in street fighter 4 anymore so that's just but yeah so and 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 there's still you know a decent amount of of people that wanted to talk and like i like what you do and, and this isn't that so um yeah that that's that's more the thing now and um as far as the negative reputation uh there so the internet is also in some ways like a uh, chatty Kathy high school sort of, you know, <laughs> if you can use your imagination to connect the two things. No, no, no and, way, no way. <laughs> um, I, I, uh, I think it's more catalyst, the creator of event hubs and president of the company. It's more his story to tell. So I don't really want to mm. um, go into too much in detail, but just that sure you can already existed and he worked with them for a while and then said, you know, I, I can do what's going on here, but I can do a whole bunch of other things too. And yeah. um, wanted to initially do that with SRK, um, or maybe it was like the SRK forums. Um, mm-hmm. But they, they, for whatever reason, didn't want to. So he went off and, and made event hubs. And then like anything, like from when I was a kid, it was PlayStation versus Nintendo. There is Apple versus yeah. Android that people love to, you know, like, cut things in half and, and be on a team. There was yeah. event hubs in Shoryuken. And apparently uh, back in the day, there was always, uh, you know, accusations of uh, copying and, and whatnot each other. And uh, yeah. I, I've heard from the event hub side that they that they actually planted um, like incorrect information or typos just to see. And they, sh- they saw those pop up in um, certain other authors on Shoryuken's uh, website or in their articles and such. So, uh, um, there's a lot, but, but people were on team this or team Matt, and there were some big names on yeah. team SRK. And so, uh, everyone that, I mean, you can see how that sort of a thing, word of yeah. mouth and the emerging Twitter land and everything and, and Facebook, um, event hubs just 
didn't have the charisma at the time. But I, I will say that Event Hubs has found an audience that has kept it around. Um, so for as many times as people will say there's, you know, the tier lists are wrong, which all, oftentimes they can be because they're they're community voted on tier lists. And we have to uh, go in there sometimes when it's very obviously wrong, whether either reset them or, you know, just alter it because we don't want to give people obviously wrong information, you know, and yeah. say a certain characters. That, but that you know, there's a lot of things that we do. And, and so to you know maintain those things, sometimes they fall behind and whatnot. Um, the but but. At the end of the day, there's a lot of people that use event hubs for a lot of different things. And it's not just the uh, something I had to really teach myself is not just the top of the top competitive minded people. In fact, there's not there's not always something for them on event hubs. Like every so often you get patch notes, they're going to be interested, things like that. New content for, yeah. for games. But a lot of the day to day stuff is how to better your anti airs. And to be honest, you can always benefit from those kinds of things, because even if they're just reminders to you, but not necessarily yeah. content that, uh, you know, everybody's going to want to check out all the time. And that's yeah. fine. But there is enough of an audience that uh, it's it's kept the company going for, I think, 15 years now. I think this is our 15 year anniversary. And, um, you know, where, where other sites have come and gone and then hubs is, is still around Knockwood, And we're very thankful for every day that that continues to be where, where Google will give us enough traffic <laughs> to, to put food on the table. So, yeah. um, and, uh, and, and yeah, but, uh, yeah, there's, there's always going to be haters and stuff. And, and to an extent that's, that's kind of a good thing, you know, that you're, uh, you're doing something, you don't want people to be apathetic and, yeah. uh, and, and there's, you know, from competitive stuff, serious stuff to very not serious stuff, cosplay, yeah. Um, things that are just visually pleasing for one reason or another, you know, and, and everything in between that and trying to write some deep, um, thoughtful piece about why I don't think Street Fighter 6 should be a two touch game. And um, yeah. that you know, kind of thing, I'll sit down and I'll really think about it and, you know, really take some time and, and then really go through the comments and, and try to respond to people if they, if they're actually engaging and not just trolling. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, and, and everything in between. So. <laughs> so, yeah, I've had so, a couple. Okay. Um, so you mentioned that you joined Event Hub, Hubs as a writer, um, and now you are. Uh, we, we introduced you as kind of the 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 driving force of a lot of the podcasts and the video production. Yes. Um, what what drove you to that uh, to the to the direction of the video, um, like so, as opposed to staying a writer? That was kind of the idea since I started. But when my boss was like, "I want you to do video," I didn't. I didn't have an idea of what that even meant. And it's because I had gone to college, like I said, for TV and film and, and television and stuff. And I'd learned some video and, and editing stuff, but I didn't, I, I, that didn't resonate with me. And I grew writing on the front page for a while and learned the ways of all of that and, and got used to sort of the rhythm of, of, you know, when people are on, what kind of stories to do at what time of day and, and, you know, how to work with my, my teammates. And it's all, it's all virtual. We have only a virtual water cooler chat and Skype is the closest thing we have to a water cooler. <laughs> and um but we've we've met each other a handful of times at places like capcom cup or at evo and uh, that's really cool but otherwise we just uh you know meet over the internet and um yeah and and hopefully try not to be too chatty kathy uh high schooly <laughs> when we uh we were, no but we're, we're good uh it's 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 friend and it's close to to family you know it's it's small business sort of approach and so it's it's always been a really good um close tight-knit group that uh we 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 work together we play together sometimes we'll do like um play left for dead together uh just to blow nice. off steam at the end of a long day or something and that's a it's still a classic really fun to, to play and to co-op with um things like that ninja turtles and um <laughs> very cool nice. um so another thing is like of all the guests that we've interviewed um you know we've interviewed sponsored players we've interviewed like old heads that have been in the game for you know 20 years mm -hmm. um i think you're the only guest that i know of that is like making a living on the fighting game community or like in the out of fighting games really mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. and so you know i don't it's a it's a unique perspective in that um you know your work and your hobby or your something you're passionate about they they kind of have merged together in a lot of ways and i, I was curious about like what your experience is with that how do you how do you keep things compartmentalized at, like how do you know like to how do you know how much is too much fighting games in in john's day-to-day -day life Sure, sure. Man, there's a lot to all that. Um, yeah. uh, my mind goes like 16 places at once, and I can choose <laughs> one of them. Um, but I will say that it was very much a play-by-feel uh, approach to life, where I went out <laughs> to LA to do something, but my gut was, I want to... <laughs> I'm going to go out of my way to schedule. I was working at Red Lobster at the time, uh, uh, serving and bartending. And I was like, I'm going to go out of my way to make sure I say, you can't schedule me on Wednesday nights. Wednesday mornings are fine. Just the lunch shift, though. 
and I would make sure that when Street Fighter, competitive Street Fighter was available, I was there. And that meant leaving at a certain time because LA traffic is balls. Yeah. And it meant, you know, like contacting people, going over to online Tony's side of town where it was <laughs> online Tony. <laughs> it was dark and, and, and scary at times and trying to find parking like three miles away and walking not that far. But it was it felt like it sometimes. And, uh, you know, driving all over the place because L.A. is so spread out. But it made yeah. it a, a, a point to pursue that. And um, and then, you know, like I said, I told you the story of how it all came together at the same time I was writing and, and wanted to do something primarily with writing. And here it was the marriage of the two. And in some ways I'd call that, uh, you know, success. And, and I'm very fortunate that that appeared to me and, you know, that that was in my path and I was able to take advantage of it. And now here we are, uh, you know, a thousand years later, I'm still doing it. So, um, and enjoying it. And yeah. And, and like to your point about being able to make a career out of it, professional fighting gaming is, is starting to get there with some of these prize pools, but it's still, it's not there in the way that a lot of other esports are, you know, where the the 50th or the 100th best player maybe can survive just playing competitively. I, I don't know how deep the, you know, the, the big MOBAs and Counter-Strike and Overwatch go, but I, I assume that there's a lot of money in there. And um, fighting games aren't quite there yet. So even though you have these really top ranked players, only a handful of them uh, actually, you know, can make much of a living on it. And a lot of them are now finding that it's a lot easier to do that from streaming. So yeah, it's hard to, to make a living in the fighting game community. And I'm very fortunate that I um, am among some of the few that have found a way to uh, to live off of it in, in this way. And for as long as that you know goes on, uh, I'm, I'm thankful. Nice. Yeah. That's, um, yeah. I think of when I think of a penthouse too. It's like um, it's funny because like I've been featured in a few articles. I think because of you from various things. From whether it was like tech things on Twitter, or it was even like a Dalsum shirt that I had I had found online at the time, like he had put that as an article one day. And um, like, I never know about him because like, I don't really like, I wasn't really looking at the site often. And like, some of my friends from Alaska would be like, hey, did you know you're in this article on Event Hubs? And I'm like, what? And I'm just like, then I'd go look at it like, oh, that's cool. And like, you know, you give me credit or whatever, the Twitter and stuff like that. But one thing I thought was interesting, you brought up uh, regarding Event Hubs and like, sure, you can like, Earlier, you were talking about like the FGC family, right? Like you could go somewhere and reach out to like a friend and mutual friends and stuff, right? And it's just like, hey, do you guys know somebody here? Oh yeah, this is my buddy John. You know, you know, show him the show him the ropes or whatever, show him around, right? But then like you also taught, brought up like the divide between at the time like Evan Hunts and Shoryuken, and like it just made me think of kind of like the whole OGs versus New Blood thing, and it was just like Shoryuken was like the OGs, and mm -hmm. then Event Hubs was like the New Blood, and there's always that kind of divide in the community, despite like all the family and all the community stuff that's that's good with it there always seems to be like this divide between like the older games and the new games or the old school and the new school when it comes to things and people always want to like i mean in some ways it's like you said it's like it's kind of like bad press but it's like at the same time it's like it gets people talking about stuff right like oh this parry is not as good as it was in third strike or this and that like you know mm -hmm. it definitely brings a a whole other side to the community other than like the good stuff I think also a big significant part of that is people will conduct themselves differently online than they will when they're interacting in person. And so if you're mm. traveling to events and you meet up with with people, uh, you, you, I'm not to say that there's never been any physical confrontations in the FGC, but like you're a lot less likely. It's like, yeah, we're, we're brothers, you know, we're we're here in, in New York and, you know, we we <laughs> we want to beat each other at the game. There's a competition <laughs> there, but we're we're in person. There's a kind of an obligated cordiality that leads to, um, you know, kind of a kindness and, and a lot of people are just nice anyway. Um, yeah. but, but like, I think a lot less happens there, but when it's all online, um, a la event hubs and sure you can, it's easy to, to get into a comment section and be a real troll and, and, you know, yeah. right to the top and, and right into center stage and yeah. sort of set the the pace for things. So they're, they're, it's always inflated. I think it, it always feels like there's more of that than there actually is because as we know, it floats to the top. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Like I, I was actually just talking about that with my son today in terms of like watching football and stuff like that. Like you get the oh. people that are like really big fans and like they're kind of like cutthroat and at each other's throats, right? When it comes to like the winning and losing of these games. And then they see the players afterwards and they're like, cordial with each other and exchanging jerseys and asking about their families and people are like why are you smiling you just lost to this guy and it's just like because they're human beings and they're friends and they're yeah. you know they're fans of each other at the end of the day right and it's like we're not you know we don't hate each other or they don't hate each other right like it's it's kind of crazy to think that there's people out there that think that you know you guys should just be at each other's throats for whatever reason well let me ask you this because uh i happen to be not a huge 
sports guy, but if I have a team, it's the 49ers. And I yeah. feel like your uh, recent relationship with the 49ers might not uh, be so hot. <laughs> No, it's it's been fine like there's like you said there's there's people <laughs> online like especially on twitter like i pretty much just block like i mean there's even rams fans like that that are just like too fanatical and i'm just like you guys yeah. are like on the deep end like i don't want to be with you guys like i'm just trying to watch and have a good time and like you know um i have my actually my best friend is a niners fan and it's just it's one of those things that's like it's kind of like the balance to this all because it's like for every 10 people that are horrible online like i have a friend that's like reasonable and we can chat and we can talk football and you know we hang sure. out and do all kinds of stuff with our families and you know we're not at each other's throats so it's just like again i think it's like you said can the I online thing is exasperated and people just kind of think that we should just be at each other's throats all the time yeah <laughs> um earlier you mentioned the uh that your, you know, your name and being part of Wednesday Night Fights was a big, uh, like, boost for your your ability to to get a job at Event Hubs. Mm -hmm. um, so we we talked about how being a player uh, made you a better writer in a lot of ways. Being like being a fighting game player like makes you a more informed fighting game writer. But um, how does do, does writing for the site help you become a player, better player? You think it especially. Um, well, like I say, I didn't feel like I got better. Uh, I, I introduced a new sort of the sciencey part to the otherwise kind of, I, I would say it as like the poets and the scientists that, you know, playing by feel versus playing by the numbers and frame data and such. So I introduced that for Street Fighter V and that was kind of close to when I started working uh, for Event Hubs. And yes, it highlighted uh, a lot okay. of things for me that uh, were, you know, just even if I was just putting together a video for or, or, or like, um, you know, sharing a video or sharing tech or sharing, uh, you know, frame data and whatnot, um, because it didn't used to be readily available in the games, there would be my, my, my focus would go on to it. And I would see the benefits of it. And if it was that apparent in front of me, then I would be intrigued enough to sort of pursue it and maybe implement it more or try it out. And while I found myself kind of caught between uh, not really finding a, a comfortable spot between the poet and the scientist, um, it, it certainly put the scientific stuff in front of me. Okay. Yeah, you kind of had to go out there and find the tech for us. <laughs> you had yeah. to be your yeah. you had to be Nick for all of us, basically. Yep. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I I know some people that are like, you couldn't pay me to go into training mode, and it sounds like that might actually be what happened for you. <laughs> that was me. I. I... I just never really appreciated it. Now I, I do like it. And I, I like that you can train while you're waiting for a match. Although that's not if you're really serious about it because it's so interruptive and whatnot. But yeah. um, I, I like that feature. And sometimes I'll use it just for quick little processes that I can, you know, practice on repeat, like parrying a Blanca ball or something like that or drive impacting it. Um, yeah. But but yeah, I, I was just a, like, ah, people would ask me af because they didn't know Goken and they'd be like, you know, they'd lose and then they'd go, what uh you know what are you after whatever situation? what are you after sweep and for the longest time like i, I can usually push a button or <laughs> I, I can usually block. <laughs> right uh and and i just i didn't know i didn't know the frame data i didn't I, like it wasn't until street fighter 5 that i really uh i knew what it meant but i really appreciated what it meant to be you know like plus one versus plus three or, or zero you know like i had heard the terms people talk about it all the time I really, really just felt my way through it all in um, mm -hmm. in SF4. And in some ways that was detrimental. Like I wouldn't change. And then I still wrestle with updating. I think like I said earlier, getting 10 3 even though I knew what I was doing wrong. I still wrestle with updating things in real time. I'm, I'm not as good at that as I'd like to be. But um, but yeah, I used to just, uh, <laughs> whatever my gut told me to do, like they were in the, my brain would catch up later. Yeah. That's that. Okay. I mean, I don't know. That's kind of that old school mentality, like playing Street Fighter Two and stuff, arcade mentality, right? Because you didn't have training mode and stuff to figure it out. It was kind of like you learn stuff on the fly. Somebody hits this button, and like, if you're like, like you said, like you were playing the first ten, you don't know the matchup. If you're playing somebody for the first time or a character for the first time, it was kind of like, okay, what can I do after this? Oh, I can't do anything after this. Or this button doesn't work. This doesn't work. This doesn't work. Okay, mm -hmm. well, okay, I can't do anything about this. So. Yeah, it's just, that's kind of how I was too. I mean, I think uh, me and John were actually just talking about this recently. Like, I think with Street Fighter Six, this has been probably the most time that I've spent in the lab, like trying things out or even trying to like learn how to deal with things than I ever have when it's playing competitively. Same. 
Yeah. So we've, we've talked a little bit about, uh, about six, but as far as like your general impressions of the game, like, what do you think of six? I think that it is the most balanced street fighter entry yet. And that includes the refined versions of SF four and SF five and obviously everything else. Um, it's not perfect. If like, as I wrote recently and we did a, a video on, if there is one thing I would change, it's two hit KOs. And, um, and I, we don't have to talk too much on that, but I, I will just say, it's like, I don't want to see Marissa directly nerfed. I think she should have an advantage over everybody else that she has to touch you fewer times to KO you. I just don't think that number should be two because that just doesn't, there, there's too much chance for random happenings there where it doesn't yeah. feel as far as a competitive contest, there's too much room for, uh, for like uh, the, the, someone got lucky. Yeah. Um, and, and so that's just, that, that's my thought on it. But as far as the balance of the game goes, I, I feel like every time we're like, Oh, there's something broken, which is very common, uh, in, in vanilla versions of the game and beyond, but especially the mm -hmm. vanilla version, uh, we find just, you know, a week or two later, Oh, mm, I was wrong. They had thought about this and here are at least, you know, an answer or two, an answer and a half to this situation. And as I implement it, it's just becoming a more complex, but balanced puzzle. And that's not to say that there isn't a tier list. There are better characters than others, but I feel like, I mean, even the worst matchups uh, can be uh, toppled. See Snake Eyes beating a JP player, uh, resetting in the grand finals. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, we can talk about how that's just a particular player. It is, but it happened. And that's, you know, it's not nothing. And I think people can do that with these characters. I think that they've really done a good job balancing um, moves on specific, like, not only within the characters, which I think they did a good job making all of the moves work as a as a whole for every individual Street Fighter V character. Problem was they didn't keep all the other characters in mind. I think they've done that with six, but they've also done it with the other characters in mind. And even to the point where the grappler archetype, which is so different at a certain level than everybody else because of the way they play, they kind of have a, a little bit of a rock, paper, scissors element that just is mm -hmm. a little different. Um, they've even done a, a decent job balancing grappling characters, generally speaking, in this game. And, and they do seem to be the lower tiers, but they have interesting abilities and, and a fighting chance and in a way that doesn't seem kind of cheap on either side. And then they're like, it's a, it's a struggle for them, for sure. But they have yeah. the tools, and if they can take advantage of them, it feels closer to um, playing balanced than, than I think it ever has before, even with that archetype. So I think they've broken ground um, with Street Fighter six in ways that they never have, but Street Fighter four and five, especially, but all of them have been stepping stones toward that. And we're, we're lucky to be at that point now. I actually, yeah. I, think, I like the idea of framing it uh, like four and five as stepping stones, but in, in your mind, do you think this like six is more like five or like four as somebody who's played both games? Um, I, uh, I suppose it has more in common with five, but I, I mean, it's, it's more engaging and therefore it's more like four to me, uh, yeah. four had okay. some, some BS, like every, every game has had some pr pretty big BS, but four yeah. was still engaging in that the risk reward still felt like it was in your control enough and you could rely on, uh, your, your kind of your skill to get you out of situations uh, you know not always there was vortex and there was option selects and such but um it, it was always interesting right up to the end and a lot of times five would just be a game until v trigger and then a whole other game and it, it felt kind of disconnected and the v trigger yeah. part of it was the only thing that mattered and, and kind of like a black hole so i think it's got more in common with five because if you think of it as a single entity that continues to evolve and indeed a lot of the people that worked on probably both four and five, but at least five are the ones that worked on six. Um, yeah. They've taken lessons and they've evolved the same thing and five is closer to it. So I think in a lot of ways five, but there are in certain ways it, it resonates with four more. Okay. Yeah. It, it, would it and be, the, would it be too much to, to call six almost like a refined version of five or do you think six has, is strong enough in its own identity? I think six is uh, it's pretty different because they did things like one, the, the global mechanic is now back to being much closer to a universal mechanic. It varies still a little bit from character to character, but we all have the same basic five aspects of it where yeah. V triggers and V skills were night and day between every different character. And that was a yeah. huge part of what defined that game and what defined a character's ability. Yeah. So 
um, because everybody has this uh, basic defensive and offensive tools, they always sort of have a chance. And then they've done a, a good job of bringing Perry, which was one of the things that made Street Fighter 3 so fun. And although it wasn't a balanced game, it felt like you had a fighting chance and that your destiny was in your hands was because of Perry. Perry also messed up. Here's a good example of why I think six is so good. Perry messed up fireballs in a certain way where, you know, in street fighter two and alpha fireballs were something. And in street fighter three, because of Perry, it, it really um, diminished and watered down fireballs when we're now used in select areas, but certainly not like they used to be. And yeah. because you could just parry, parry, parry and build some meter right. for it. So you wouldn't use it. And um, so they, got i in my opinion they've harnessed what was good about perry and street fighter 3 in sf5 but then they've also done something to offset that and make fireball still worthwhile in the way that fireballs are relatively faster parry costs something there's a different tier of parry whether you do it perfectly or not and mm -hmm. um and how the fireballs are now buffed in other ways like the double hitting ones are, are like a tour de force and you can use those strategically in ways that you really haven't been able to before so they've done a good job of balancing multiple things that have been you know the fireball throwing was a pillar of sf2 and, and has been huge in the franchise the parry was huge in three focus attack and these cancels were huge in four and, and and footsies have been something that people have always wanted and then five they were really getting into how to make like i was saying earlier characters work together and not have any useless moves and and all of their moves are supposed to serve a certain purpose for a greater ultimate cause and they did the whole v yeah. skills feed into v triggers in and that's your super you know spirit bomb move at the end or, or or status or whatever your character did but then you'd use low forward in tandem with standing medium punch because of the way the hurt boxes and the speeds worked and the distances and and that was all there in five that was their big development because in four there were a lot of moves that just didn't serve purposes or that didn't make sense or that right, was completely right. uh, yeah know, didn't work for a character uh for their for their game plan um like i said they just sort of did that within the individual vacuums of each character and now in six they've taken that but they've applied it to the entire roster and now you have a game where rashid can can be there and not be just ridiculously dumb he can have fun goofy crazy stuff but it's still regulated decently well and how zangief can be you know terrible but still be able to get in and do some really fun sbds in, in a way that feels relatively balanced and like he still has a fighting chance um, despite yeah. what whiny people on Twitter might say, you know, and, <laughs> and so um, I, I really do think that that they've thought of perhaps not everything, but a lot of things um, in yeah. balancing Street Fighter Six on a lot of different layers. Yeah, it you almost feels like. Up, oh, god, sorry. Go ahead. Ben. I was gonna say. I was gonna say you brought up grapplers in particular, and like Zangief, and it's it's one of those things that's very polarizing. Like we've talked to to Saber uh, Scott about it a lot, and it's one of those things. that's like you can't make grapplers too strong, and they're probably the probably the toughest uh archetype to balance you know but like mm -hmm. it's a specialty matchup right between uh like zangief or or dawson like you don't want to make them too good because then they end up dominating dominating the game and it's mm -hmm. just like when i think of a grappler like part of like playing that type of character is the struggle like there's gonna be matches that are just terrible like zangief and sagat traditionally has been a terrible matchup for right. zangief and that and like and i just feel like that's how it should be. Like there shouldn't be matches where like every match doesn't need to be a five, five, you know, I mean, it's the meta like, outside of the game, like the expectations yeah. and the development and how like, that's just been the, the struggle for, for grapplers, but now we're aware it is a badge of pride and there's yeah. an extra weight of honor if you win, because you're, you know, have that extra kind of difficulty in your, yeah. in your play. Like, yeah, you gotta, you gotta navigate that minefield of projectiles and get in there. And it's just like, mm -hmm. you know, then you get to play your game. And then, you know, then of course you hear the, Sagat player or somebody else like, oh, I got I got Zangief or I got put into the vortex. <laughs> yep. Well, and that's the thing. Rappelers, I think the reason why it's so hard to balance them as an archetype is because at some level they do turn the game into a rock, paper, scissors. And, and that's true as soon like that's true no matter what but there's like a certain level that we kind of accept that at and a certain level that we don't and it, it feels like if they their their game is getting in like that's where the majority of the skill in the grappler and the and the non-grappler mm -hmm. but in that matchup is played because when the grappler is not in he's very obviously at disadvantage and when the grappler is in he now has a very big advantage but that sliding like advantage goes from one side to the other pretty quickly and mm -hmm. so it's like 
the 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 game is determined not so much by like individual touches or or it can be all like one because the grappler gets in and then if they have a vortex situation which has been the case for a lot of, of grappling because like the reward is once you're in you're in and now you have a massive advantage um yeah. it start then for the defender it feels like rock paper scissors and it is and and it's not in their favor the get the grappler has like a little bit of an advantage because of the, their proximity because they had to earn their way getting there anyways it, at, at some level it's a different game than you know what shotos and what rushdowns and, and even zoners play and uh, people are you get too different and you're not playing the same thing anymore and it's so unfair that it's so grapplers have been around since pretty much the beginning and they're kind of grandfathered in but I, I i have a hard time seeing you know perfectly balancing and, and i don't think we should have an, ex, uh, an expectation for that i think it should kind of be and, and, and we also i should say we don't really want grapplers to be the best characters like you said benny because then they're going to kind of take all of the attention and so they can be here but they've got to be mid-tier ish kinds of, of characters otherwise it sort of upsets the balance of the game for everybody is that fair no but that's as far as i yeah. can tell how it is and i will say though that i, I do think that uh, Capcom has done a really good job in Street Fighter 6 of cinching that gap up and making grapplers. They're still on the lower end, it seems, but yeah. they, they seem to have an interesting different fighting chance and they don't have the vortex like they've they've had in the past. So they, they've done a lot different with grapplers and it, it's it's interesting to me. So um, I, I don't know if it's the right way to do it. I don't know how much it exactly fixes, but I think it does a little bit and it's an interesting new way and it's not overtly broken as far as I can tell. So that's good. Yeah. So I, I think one of the cool things that that you alluded to there, Benny. Um, and this is a consistent theme that I've heard on, on, on talk and block John, um, is that it's, it's very narrative driven, right? Like there's a, um, there are characters that the, 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 the world is okay with being top tier. Like Akuma, yes. I remember listening to an episode a long <laughs> time ago, uh, where you mentioned Akuma, uh, you know, uh, people are okay with Akuma having all those tools. He's been grandfathered in as you, as you put it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, when you, those those narratives are, are are the struggle that Benny mentioned too. Those narratives are enticing. They, they the storylines are what make a lot of the the excitement out of fighting games, and I I think that marries very nicely with the the, the journalistic angle as well. People are engaged by uh, stories and narratives that um, are exciting or that have an underdog or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so all this to to lead to how does that how do we reconcile that with game balance because. You know, every season of Street Fighter V and every new version of Four, it was a quest towards you know perfect balance. And in an asymmetrical game like this, you're never going to have perfect balance. Even in chess, you know, white has advantage over black, right? Yeah. So, I'm curious about from your perspective, John, who has both the the player and the journalist hat to wear here. If an imaginary fighting game comes out, or even six, for example, if they rebalance it and they don't compress the tiers, and instead they just do something to flip the tiers completely upside down, and you just have hmm. a completely different top five, and uh, you know JP Ken and, and Jury and whatnot are lower on the tier list, and everybody just has to switch, which is very similar to like competitive card game metas, where just you know things just die, you know, and then you just everybody has to switch to brand new characters. Hmm. Would you prefer that, or would you prefer? the 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 quest for perfect balance and getting as well, close as you can to that yeah you, you have to wrestle around with that definition of perfect balance because as you say it's an asymmetrical game as soon as two characters have you know a different standing heavy punch it's there's going to be one is better than the other in a certain way so right. Uh, right you try to you try to mitigate that by making as many avenues toward victory as possible and then have characters have you know excel at different avenues and such and, and then also balance the effectiveness of those avenues so i like pursuing it on that level thinking about it in those terms um as far as your question about the characters and the tiers where they are right now what if they all flipped um, my, my first thought from that was well with how i perceive the balance to be now it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world and i play a character that i think is in the top five jp um, a lot of people say he's top three, maybe top two, maybe top one. Mm -hmm. But uh, that would imply that he goes down to the bottom. I feel like there are uh, there are advantages for sure, but that the way that this has been balanced, you can find the answers. And so if he has to work a little bit harder or a little bit uh, you know less hard, I, I think that being on the bottom wouldn't be the worst. And <laughs> that's this is me <laughs> talking from the top, from the upper bluffs of Tier Town, right? <laughs> but I, I do think that it's close enough. And and um. I play Lily now as a secondary. I actually took her to casuals the other day 
and and did just fine with her. I, I won a few times against um, some of our top people in Tucson, and when I lost, it was like last game, last round. And uh, she's regarded as one of, if not the worst characters in the game, and she's a grappler and, and all that. But man, she's got tools, I can tell you that. And she's fun, and she's engaging in certain ways that JP isn't. So if they switched it all, uh, I wouldn't be super worried about that, and I could continue to play JP. I'm going to play Aki as well yeah. when she comes out and see how see what she's all about. I have a much more open kind of point of view of this um, than I than I used to. But um, I, I think it'd be okay. Uh, so so does that answer your question, or is there more to it? Yeah. I, I guess it's it's that, but it's also like, you know, from uh from the journal like I, I worry that we get to a point where like if it's so balanced that it's boring and nobody mm -hmm. wants to talk about you know who's the best oh. or who's the worst anymore and well do you see, ever see a future fueled. like that yeah probably not because the uh again the mean girl's power force is strong and <laughs> here's let me let me vent a little bit uh so as a jp player and feel free to disagree guys um yeah. because you guys are not jp players and uh it seems like right now he's one of if not the hottest topics in the uh in the twitter verse for the fg or for street fighter 6 yep. he's mm -hmm. unfair he has abilities that have never existed quite like his his do in street fighter the franchise uh, he's got so much privilege, as my uh, co-workers would say, <laughs> and he just doesn't have to work as hard as other characters. My theory is he's a strong character, like I said, top five, and Kakaru has, has proved that he's, he's, really, he's really good. Uh, but he has holes in his gameplay that because he is so different than what we have seen before are not as intuitive, but they are programmed into the situations, and even a character like a grappler like Lily gives JP a hard time if she knows how to approach the match. Now, what people on social media do is they get frustrated, especially by a zoning character that they don't understand and they get spike infinited because they don't know that you have to block one and then you could advance and then there's a guessing game to play. And if you write, you get the, it's, it's his ass. And if not, you rinse and repeat and start again. Instead, they just get hit over and over again and get mad and they go on Twitter <laughs> and they cry and they whine and then a bunch of people like it and they retweet it and they put like pile on top and then someone shares a clip of JP doing way too much damage, which by the way, I don't think he should be able to kill you in two hits. I think damage should be um, uh, lessened and that you know, he's, he's part of that problem too right now. Um, but they'll put some crazy mix up and it'll, oh, who's ever going to block that? It's like, yeah, well, parry exists. And as soon as you get down from the high of it, you see that there are answers. You just have to put them under the microscope a little bit more for a new different character. But that he struggles against other characters just fine. And that I think he's reasonably well balanced as a high tier character. And that's what it's all going to amount out to be. But social media will not get there. They will whine and they will complain and they will hold on to that and they will be blinded. And I mean, look at... Uh, you know, social media, social political issues, they, they will always be there, you know, and, yeah. and people will be able to make a living off of that kind of a thing. So the drama will always be there. In Capcom, the developers have to deal with that. Um, that's one of the reasons I do not envy having to balance these games. I can I can look at my own intuition, but you see enough people say one thing, especially when it gets hot and catches on. And then you just sort of begin to accept it. That's a very common social happening as well, right? So you have to sift through and know what's just early. I didn't do my homework and now I'm mad. So I'm whining and a lot of people like what I have to say or how I said it. And it's a convincing argument. But after we do some investigating, it's not, we're going to see that there's an answer, um, you know, weeding that out and stuff that actually needs to be attended to to make the game a better game. So um, no, I, in short, I think that people will always whine because they love doing it. <laughs> and, uh, and and that's part of all of us. There's part of me that I'm not completely unbiased, of course. So, uh, but yeah, that that's where that comes from. And there that th there will always be a demand. Yeah, that yeah, makes sense. Like, yeah, it's, it, you mentioned like JP not being a traditional character, and that just kind of made me think because uh, uh, Street Fighter, the Street Fighter social media team recently posted like the the rankings for like the the top five characters being used. And mm -hmm. initially, JP, like back in back in June, was but like fifth in that ranking. It was like it's Ken, uh, Marissa, Ryu, uh, Mano, and then JP was back in June. And then since July, Ma Mano has been replaced at number four with Cami, and then JP replaced with Jury. And then it's been the same for the last month too. So he's and, not in the top five anymore. Yeah, so he's not in the top. Well, this is for the uh, the platinum to the master ranks. Mm -hmm. In the in the lower ranks, he's not in there at all. Like you know, I I didn't expect that either. And part of that, I think, is because he's not a traditional type of character. He's not, you know, uh, you know, the typical Ryu Ken. Uh, not at all. 
Arch he's more anime, shows, right? He's more Mortal yeah. Kombat. People are comparing him to other franchises. Yeah, yeah. so like I, th- I feel like there's the kind of this inherent uh, kind of difficulty with him that that maybe like maybe it's the online thing and like I think with social media like in particular with the FGC I think you see more of the kind of the hardcore perspective those are the people that are out there whining and complaining about a lot of this stuff and there's probably a lot of casual players that you know think he's strong or think he's cool or whatever but that's not like who we're seeing in the actual like game itself yeah I as a JP player um he's like i said he's been under the microscope because he has been performing well in tournaments and when i say he's been performing well he pops up a handful of times in high placings and then cocker wins Mm -hmm. with him and um i i feel like he's people have put him under the microscope and they've figured out where where his holes are and like one of the things for instance um that i would always i would hear is that if he touches you once even with a light then you're full screen and have to go through his entire zoning process again and it's like no if he touches you with a light then you're likely going to get put about you know three quarters three quarter screen and that's completely different in terms of what he can do if full screen you know if he hits you with a full drive rush combo he sends you full screen and then that's a different situation but in terms of how locked down you are and how limited you are in your options night and day from one and the other. And at the beginning, people equated the two to the same thing. It's like, that's because you don't understand. But once you understand that difference, a lot of new options open up for you and, and things happen in a snowball because once you realize that, or once he can't do a certain thing anymore, it's like when you shut down a Honda that's just headbutting all day and you show them that you can perfect mm-hmm. parry once or twice, a lot of the times they freeze up and they don't have a secondary game plan <laughs> and everything else falls <laughs> apart. And right now it feels uh, as far as at least my personal experiences and what I'm seeing as uh, you know, people like Angry Bird 10-1 Kakaru in, the, uh, in, a, in a first of 10 um, because mm-hmm. he's put under the microscope JP. Um, that people have figured those things out. And now I, I'm struggling to win sets online. I, I think the last three or four times I've played online, I've had easily like losing uh, records. And it just feels like people know when to push forward. They know when there are holes and in in, in they know where the guesses are. They know how to block stuff. Yeah. Ultra two is, is hardly a thing anymore. And it used to be free hits. I mean, sorry, super two. I'm a Street Fighter four player. And <laughs> uh, I'm just getting away with less and less stuff and having to earn things. Yeah. And then when, when you turn him into a... Uh, uh, a footsies character like he's got some good buttons but the his walk speed is, is a hard thing to uh to overcome that's one of his biggest weaknesses and now yeah. you're at a point where um that's becoming a factor people are making that part of the game because they're not letting him just get away with constant zoning and uh yeah. and that's gotten to a a soft fleshy patch that uh is, is difficult for jp to overcome so i think people are figuring him out and i think he's going to be falling down yeah. the tier list um uh, yeah, soon. I see like that's something that um me and John or yeah I think John's talked about too in terms of being like one of the best uh the top players in Arizona right it's like you know being one of the best characters in the game like you you have that target on your back right like vanilla mm-hmm. Sagat right people mm-hmm. people will lab certain things or at least the people that want to learn and try to overcome that kind of stuff are going to lab certain things they're going to figure out how to beat that kind of stuff and you know a lot of the stuff that you hear you know and od amnesia is too strong or or like you said the the spikes and whatever all this stuff is too strong but it's just like once you start breaking things down and you start figuring stuff out like i feel like for those those top characters that becomes um almost a bigger hurdle like you said like you have more difficulty now and it's because people are like this character is strong let me find out what i could do against it mm-hmm. whereas like you know the the mass the vast majority of people that want to complain aren't, aren't doing that kind of stuff they just want to be like oh whatever he just won this or you know there's five jps in the top eight for this tournament like okay so what but did yeah. he end up winning you know and there's a lot doesn't. of really high flying clips and combos online of resets yeah. and crazy stuff that we've never seen before and some of that stuff is really good but but there are answers you know and, and people yeah. just want to stop right there and and, and just go with it and, and also information travels so quickly now you don't have to just mm-hmm. learn at the arcade where a quarter every time and sit in line and there's no training mode and, and all that you know you can just go online and look up videos look up go on to forums go on social media and you'll have your answers very very quickly you know so yeah. everyone's learning together in a way that they haven't before so i think that the tier lists to go back to a slightly earlier topic the tier lists are going to move around in a certain way too there because people are going to explore figure out and and because Street Fighter Six is such a well 
um, generally balanced. And it's it's on a level of balance that it, the franchise never has been, as far as I'm concerned. And because it's on that level of balance, which I, of course isn't going to be perfect, but is is so close that it will be interesting. And they maybe will do things like you were saying, John, where the top five and the bottom five actually switch, and that would be really cool to explore. So the more we talk about it and kind of dig into this concept, and given the playing field that we're on right now, I do think that it would be interesting. And and I and I do think that stuff will continue to move around. Um, with all of the forces at play, whether it be the the chatty Cathiness of the of the internet or the actual results and and everything in between. Yeah, it's like I was I was just thinking about something too because you talk about John was talking about flipping the the tier list right, and mm -hmm. uh, I remember I think it was it was a few months ago or something. I think when the game launched and you kind of I think you uh, were in the like we were in the Discord chat and then um, I had mentioned that I was playing Dalsum and I wasn't playing Honda anymore, and you said, "Oh, playing the long game." So, like, the fact that you mentioned playing Lily and then John was just talking about flipping the tier list, I was like, that's kind of a good way to think about it because you're playing, like, arguably the top character and you're playing probably, like, one of the bottom two. So it's like, if it flips, like, I'm still okay. I'm playing Lily now. And it's she's an investment, tier. baby. <laughs> that is another, like, lesson I think Street Fighter Five taught the fighting game community, at least the Street Fighter players, other games, every, every, like, balance patch culture. Like, knowing that next year your character might be very different and yeah. being able to train a secondary as a, as like a backup plan or a uh, uh, life lifeboat to jump on after your ship <laughs> <Sure>. sinks. <laughs> but I don't uh, think the ships will sink in this game. I think it'll nah. it'll just get get closer to even out, or it'll 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 maintain being interesting. A, a worry I have is like this game always like every time someone proposes a change there's always a million reasons to not make that change, right? We're like, yeah. well, what if it does this and that? Do you ever wonder if like this this could result in like, uh, I, I, it's like a card house. Like you can't change anything because it'll break other things. Like they might they might be stuck. That's, that's a big part of it. And that's why another reason why I don't envy the developers that get all this BS that they have to siphon through and, or, yeah. or sift through and make sure that they don't take at face value implement and then upset the what is already a very good balance and i think um yeah. very very everything should have purpose behind it and if you started with that and like we like with the parry versus the fireball thing it, it's clear that they were thinking many layers deep on how to put both of these things and, and capture what made them good but let them also coexist and not cancel each other out or one just make the other invalid You've done that with so many different things um, from from mechanics to archetypes to um, normals to special moves to, to everything. And so um, because that's the case, I think that they can play around with it um, um, with specific movements like, a you know, I think that we should have a universal damage nerf, which often happens after the uh, vanilla version of a game. Yes. Um, and and I can articulate like why I think part of the reason is because you know like um, people just the developers can't foresee as much information as the as the community will figure out in terms of stringing stuff together and making efficient and effective especially in a game where you start with full meter um, you know sequences and mm. combos and Street Fighter you want a certain number of interactions to happen so um, and I think those are starting to get you know you hear rumblings of people asking for a three out of five tournament standard. That means at a certain level, to the extent that that's happening, people are saying we're not running enough of the experiment to see who the more skilled player is, and we need yeah. to uh, uh, get more of the experiment, and therefore it needs to be three out of five. And for certain games, that's that's the case. I don't think that that should be the case for Street Fighter VI, but I do think that JP being able to kill you in two touches is no bueno. Um, and, and Marissa, she should be able to kill you in three, where everybody else can do it in four or more. Something like that, but not two. I so um, I would say... Yeah, uh, I think I think high damage is also like a, a way of playing it safe for the developers because oh. when 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 you when you're you're when you don't know what your your overall end game bread and butter combos are going to be and you don't know like you can you can guess at it, making the damage higher is safer because then like nothing kills a game faster than a time over, right? Like strive, yeah. everybody got mad because the game the damage was so high, but if it was timing out like Street Fighter Cross Tekken or uh, I'm trying to think of another game that. That had a bunch of timeouts that just wasn't received well. Dragon Marvel Ball Infinite was like Marvel, 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 Infinite, yeah, Marvel Infinite versus games in general. I think have that problem because people have to take a little bit longer to build out their teams and build out the game plans. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, like time overs are just not very exciting for for a lot of for the audience and for players because they want to see the the KO screen. They want to see that they want to have a Fireworks. winner. You know, yeah, yeah. Um, 
So like in a lot of ways, you want your damage to be high out of the gates to avoid time overs and let the players optimize it for you and then scale scale back the damage based on what they find. Yeah, I like that. That's I think that's true. And that's yeah. that's part of what would, would feed into that. So you saw in um Street Fighter 4, for instance, that not every character, but a lot of characters had a lot of damage reduced from uh vanilla into super. And yeah. in Street Fighter 5, you had uh initially uh v trigger activations and crush counters did not scale so those yep. things would happen and they would just be the full damage amount or regular combo scaling into whatever into level threes which would only scale to 50 percent, and it was just melting life bars on top of a lot of other gameplay issues and then issues with that but <laughs> actually yeah, street fighter 5 was my other example though that game still had time overs like with nash and ryu and whatnot and so like that oh. really hurt the game too right yes. um so you'd have like so season two is where that burst damage uh style started becoming more popular mm -hmm. we were like okay and capcom was like this is what you want right and everyone's like no no now i now i lose for making two mistakes <laughs> right right or a yep. mistake and a half into yep. an, you know into a disadvantageous guess yep. so um but but yeah so i forgot where we were going with all that uh, for more information <laughs> on losing the two mistakes check out uh check out john's most recent work um <laughs> So I have I have a question uh, for my last question for the evening here will, uh, is a kind of a game I've been asking every guest. Um, and, and the answer is different for everybody uh, because when we say footsies, it's you ask 100 people, you're going to get 100 different def definitions. So I was curious about what your personal definition of footsies was, Velociraptor. Um, I did a video on this maybe not not quite a year ago, and so that it's much more articulated there. But at the most kind of basic level, Footsies is uh, kind of the dance that you do in the neutral when both characters are um, standing and have the potential to to move around. Um, it's the attempt to engage from that from that status, you know, before one person's knocked down or in blocks done or anything like that. So it's kind of like the uh, the fencing, the, the the jousting, the the first touch, the the means of engagement, and um, and That's you can the start neutral. To differ. That everyone talks about the nooch, right? No one has the advantage. Dirty nooch, right, right, right. Okay. Um, but yeah, and then I guess so. Footsies would be the uh, the maneuvering through the neutral, um, okay. and and the engagement from the neutral, and the uh, strategy yeah. that evolves around that. Cool. Yeah. I was like, yeah. So I just gotta say, it's been refreshing to hear somebody that plays one of the top characters actually say like, like. You know, I don't think it's good that they can win in two guesses. Like a lot of times you hear people, they're just like, it's a lot of, well, if you take this away, you're going to kill my character and blah, blah, blah. Right. And they don't give you reasonable uh, nerfs. For yeah. You're always worried right? there's some bias. Yeah. So, but I, I, you know, I never even really thought about it in that way. And I think that that's a great way to look at it. It's like, yeah, you could have like a Marissa that could win in three guesses, but you know, my character is too strong. And I think that should be toned down for them as well. You know, and that's that's refreshing for me to hear. You know, amongst all the, all the Twitter verse and all that other stuff, the nonsense that you hear. Like, I just I ignore a lot of it, but like, it's hard to not like see people just constantly just try to think of things to just basically like kill off characters or just things that are just unreasonable. And it's kind of nice to hear that. And I guess um, besides that, like, was there anything uh, any, anything you wanted to shout out before before we kind of close things out? Um, well, first of all, thank you guys very much for having me on. It's it's good to be able to engage with the community. Like we've been going online more and more, and that's been really good in a lot of ways. But man, it, it's it's really cool to still uh, be doing stuff where where you know you see faces at least, and, you know, being able to <laughs> hang out um, when you guys come down for um, you know competitive events has been really nice, especially after COVID. I know it's a little bit in the in the rearview mirror at this point, but we've been uh, able to explore that in a real way on the. Um, on like the fighting game community level and i'm thankful for that so um that's been cool doing this and keeping the uh, you know like the the relationships and, and and the culture going has been really cool and uh otherwise please check out if you haven't already our youtube channel that's kind of my main thing right now so trying to to get that to grow and, and to get interesting content where we do this sort of stuff a lot and uh, and a lot of other things too like i was mentioning earlier so check that out at um you can see us on event hubs and uh on our youtube channel event hubs and uh yeah that's that's the gist of it otherwise i'll you'll, you know catch me playing some, some street fighter like i said i'm gonna try out uh the newcomer aki and i'm messing around with the, with the grappler lily just trying to broaden my horizons in street fighter 6 i i recommend that if you're a, a growing street fighter player or fighting game player in general that you do that playing a lot of different characters really helps out gives you different perspectives and it helps you grow on all levels so um yeah
Nice. Um, another thing is that our, our audience is primarily like local Arizona people or people that are interested in the local Arizona scene. And mm. um, so you've been throwing events uh, and tournaments. And so I was curious if you wanted to promote the next Down to the Wire event. No, I didn't really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I will. I will. Uh, I have to grab the uh, the event to make sure the, the, the date because we've been messing around trying to find the, the best dates for um, each month we we've been doing it on pretty much on a monthly basis. I think we we technically didn't have one in uh, um, August, but or, or it doesn't matter. The the next one's in October, and it's the first weekend in October. So actually, I could just pull up my calendar here and go. Um, it would be on the seventh. So um, yeah, we are doing at the police station on Alvernon and twenty second here in Tucson. Uh, doors open at noon. And uh, you can check it out. Uh, there's a Facebook page. If you look up uh, Down to the Wire, you can find that in the um, the Tucson and the Arizona um, fighting game community uh, groups on Facebook. So, hey, we still use that just from like the, uh, the earlier part of the story, right? <laughs> and, yeah. Uh, and yeah, you can see all the details there. We usually have some food and not usually just pizza. Um, we've been having some awesome team events after the tournament plays out where where we kind of last time we did like a playground style selection. And and I think we didn't have the top three uh, placers. So everybody else got to, you know, potentially be on these teams of five. And that was a lot of fun. We actually did two rounds of that because of how hype it was. And so it's it's been a really good time. And like I said, getting back to that offline culture is great to do, too. There's a special magic about it that you just don't get from playing online. So as much as that does afford and as easy as it is, there is something uh, it's worth coming out. So if you're in the Arizona area, <laughs> make it out to Tucson for uh, down to the wire. This will be our, our, well, it's our second down to the wire, but our third uh, monthly event thus far. And we've been having a really good time. So as these guys can, or as John, I'm hoping to see Benny pretty soon, but uh, John's made it out to a couple of them. And I, and I know that you might not make this next one because you got some pretty big stuff going on in life. Congratulations. <laughs> oh, thank but, you. Uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, it reminds me. I'll put, in, I'll put in a time off request for that and see if I can get that Saturday off because I've been I've been meaning to go down there. Like, uh, like you know, from talking to you, also it reminded me of like the times like you guys would like hold casual events and stuff in in Tucson during like the Street Fighter Five era. And like I made it out to a few of those. It's always fun to kind of get out and and play new people. Like you know, online's online's fun, but like you said, like you know, being getting the offline interactions whether that's at a tournament or just a casual gathering with some friends and stuff like that like nothing nothing beats that to me it's it's a really good time and we've been hitting all of those crucial beats i think pretty well so and we even went out to canes afterwards maybe next we time did. we do denny's who knows <laughs> yep I, I said that to sean and sean's kind of like more of a uh, of, of a food connoisseur of sorts and he's like <laughs> dude we're 30 plus now. We don't have to go to Denny's anymore. I'm like, you're right. Let's get carne asada like adults, you know? And, and so, <laughs> no, we actually, we ended up going to Cane's, so like college kids. But, you know, we, we could go do other stuff. And it's a lot It's a lot of fun. It's a good time is the point. Yeah. Cheers. Well, well, we'll leave on that note. Uh, you can find us on uh, Twitch at twitch.tv slash spiral series, YouTube at youtube.com slash spiral series, on Apple Podcasts and Spotify under Absolute Card. Thanks, everybody. And uh, we'll see you next time. There you go.